afternoon or good morning, everyone, depending on where you are. My name is Mark Soper, and I want to welcome you to uh, this look at the brand new IT Fundamentals U61 class objectives. Uh, if you're if you are familiar with the previous versions of IT Fundamentals, you're going to notice a lot of differences, a lot of improvements in this exam, and some wonder they now call it IT Fundamentals Plus. There are six objectives, as you can see. We have IT concepts and terminology, infrastructure, application and software, software development, database fundamentals, and security. So what I want to do is give you an overview, along with some examples of the content from the text uh, that, we have, that we have created to help you teach uh, this new exam. So the first of all, let's take a look at IT concepts and terminology. In this section, you're going to, and this is a, each of these is a separate chapter. You're going to be teaching your students about computer numbering systems, hexadecimal, binary, decimal, also character sets, ASCII, ANSI, and Unicode. Then there's a chapter on data types such as char, string, numbers, boolean. A look at the basic computing process, uh, inputting the data, the, the chips inside the computer processing the data, putting the data output to a screen uh, or audio or whatever, and then storing the results. Next is a look at the value of data and information. We'll start off by looking at uh, the concepts of intellectual property, trademarks, copyright, and then how companies uh, or need to value the data information that they create themselves through data capture and analysis. If you've been in the business for a long time, as I have, I've been in this business since the 1980s, the, it's amazing to look at capacity and speed changes and improvements and how they're measured. And to help your students under, understand this, we're going to be providing a lot of charts uh, that will help them to understand how much faster things used to be. And finally, uh, the eight-step process of how to troubleshoot. So let's look a little closer at some of these. Here are a couple of examples from our text uh, demonstrating the differences between decimal and binary numbers on the left, and then decimal and hexadecimal numbers on the right. And we want students to understand these concepts because different parts of, of, uh, of the computing and technology process use these different numbering systems. We also are also going to be looking at character sets, and uh, there are many, many opportunities uh, for hands-on work. Uh, students can calculate uh, binary to hex to decimal, and they can also look at the different character sets through tools such as the character map in Windows and similar features that are found in other operating systems. So we start out with the, with the ASCII characters, typically what you have on your typewriter or computer keyboard, the ANSI characters, where we get into bullets and superscripts, currency symbols, and accented letters, and you see a few examples of that below. And then finally, Unicode, in which we are able to put characters that, that support virtually all languages. We've given you a small sampling of those. And your students, again, as I mentioned, can, can look at these and try these in documents. Data types. Individual characters are called char. Strings. Which, which are phrases, numbers, and then Boolean. And you'll see some examples in, in that chapter of how Boolean logic applies. We even have a, 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 a Gantt chart in there to, or, to, uh, to, as you uh, look at how Boolean operations work. Then we look at the basics of the computing process and, and, and the parts of the computer that work with those. And then finally, we wrap up uh, this first section with looking at the data, the value of data and information. There are a lot of links in this section uh, for examples of intellectual property, trademarks, copyright, and then data capture and analysis. And in the list I've got here on screen, you can see that the examples that I've chosen are examples that are going to be very relevant for your students. Uh, the term intellectual property may not mean much, but if you say the people that created the video games, that created the music, the graphic novels, the books, the photos uh, that, you, that you enjoy. And the idea of being compensated for the hard work that, that it, that's been put in is going to be helpful. And then we have a lot of familiar trademarks that we have referenced in the text as well. 
And here's a look at the measurements of storage capacity and throughput, just one of many charts in that chapter. And uh, what we've done in this particular chart here is that we've compared the speed of, of common broadband uh, internet connections uh, to some of the slower uh, connections that you have on the back of your computer, such as USB 2 and so-called fast Ethernet. And uh, we, we, have, we have lots of charts in this, in this chapter to help students understand uh, the various differences in how fast different parts of the computer or the internet happen to be. The, the troubleshooting process as devised by CompTIA and their various certifications has uh, changed a great deal and it's now up to eight steps. And uh, what, they've, what they've been adding to this is the, is the idea of implementing solutions, verifying full system functionality and documenting findings uh, along with the other things that have been in there for a long time. And if your students can, can learn this process, if you can make it relevant for them, they're gonna be much more confident whether they're work, work, working on a problem that uh, you know, is messing up their smartphone or their tablet, or uh, a problem that they're going to be having at work or at school. This is a wonderful process, not just for technology, but for solving all kinds of issues uh, in work and life. Especially the eighth one, where you write down uh, what you found out and the outcomes and the lessons learned. And it's a great opportunity, again, for another hands-on exercise in your classrooms. In the next section, we look at infrastructure, fancy way of putting, of, of talking about uh, the hardware that makes the various parts of IT work. We start, we start with the IO devices and ports that are built into a computer. How we connect additional devices we call peripherals from displays to printers to much more. What do we find inside of a typical computer? And then we move beyond the computer itself to internet service, to storage, we go beyond PCs looking at uh, things like tablets, smartphones, and the Internet of Things, the connected devices we have out there. Then we look at network hardware and the protocols that make it work, the rules that are applied to network hardware so networking actually works, and then how to build a wireless network. So there are many, many opportunities here if you have equipment in your classrooms for some wonderful hands-on activities, and we've provided many, many figures in here that will help bridge any gaps in what you have available. Let's look, look at a few of these now. In the IO devices and ports chapter, you're gonna see many illustrations, including these. Different types of USB cables. And from the left, we have that new type C connector. And then we have the connection for USB three. And then the, the, the red cables on the end, this is the, uh, this is the uh, micro B that is very familiar with, uh, to people that have Android uh, smartphones. Next, we have the, uh, the I.O. port cluster on the back of a typical computer. And then we have an example of a 3D video card for gaming. And so these, these illustrations here uh, have been chosen because they're going to be quite relevant to your students as well as relevant to the topic. Uh, we also cover installing displays and peripherals. And we see a couple of, uh, a couple of examples here of plugging these in to, diff to typical computers. And then we take a look at inside of a typical computer, not just a desktop computer as we see at the top here, but we've also have taken apart laptop computers. We have, we have pictures from those in the, in the chapter. And then the device at the bottom is the so-called M2 uh, SSD, which uh, is equivalent to a hard drive, but uh, about, this, about the size of uh, one and a half sticks of chewing gum. And it, you'll find those in both desktops and laptop computers. So if you have machines that can be taken apart for the classroom, you can show people what these look like in 3D. We have them right here for you as well. Internet service types. And we have several illustrations in this chapter and discussions of the many different types out there, cable, uh, DSL, and fiber. And here we see some fiber optic cables similar to what uh, you may have connecting uh, your classroom to the internet or what uh, students in some neighborhoods may have uh, connections built based on as well. Storage. In our storage chapter, we have lots of figures and we've taken apart several devices. We have, uh, we've taken apart uh, an SSD drive. We've taken apart uh, a hard disk with its, with its reflective platters. 
And we've also taken apart a USB flash memory drive. But don't worry, this particular one had stopped working. There was no great sacrifice. But it's interesting to be able to see the inside story uh, of these. And so if you have the chance to take these things apart yourself, show your students, it's wonderful. But if not, we have you covered with, uh, with these outstanding illustrations. All right, we, we have uh, several chapters on networking, and we start with, uh, with uh, networking 101, you might say. So this is, this is a picture of a typical uh, Wi-Fi wireless adapter being removed out of a notebook. And we've also got pictures of other types of adapters uh, here as well, as well as, as well as discussions of the other types of devices that a network needs. We also take a look at common computing devices, uh, such as smartphones, tablets, servers, gaming consoles, then a lot of discussion of the Internet of Things or IoT. And we're going to be seeing more and more connected devices as time goes on. So your, your students will be very familiar, will be, uh, you'll help them be become very familiar with all the places where computing power is showing up in what used to be an unlikely place. In the chapter on building a wireless network, we cover the components that you need, and we also cover how to find out how busy the, the wireless networks that are already in an area are uh, happen to be. This particular chart here is showing us uh, wireless channels that are currently in use. The red ones are the 5 gigahertz band, and the blue ones at the top of the screen here are the uh, 2.4 gigahertz band that we've had for years. And you can see from the diagram at the bottom that uh, that some of these networks can be very very busy. Some of the channels are maybe in use uh, quite a bit already. So we so there's a great opportunity for a lab there and showing students how to check uh, for, for wireless channels that are that are in use already and try to select a channel that is not so busy to to have better performance. Our next topic in our text is applications and software. So we start out by looking at how, how, man, how to manage apps and software. Next we, next we take a look at uh, what the point of an operating system is and also what operating systems do. Then we look at uh, software that gets work done. Students are going to be very familiar probably with gaming apps and uh, video apps and Social media apps, but there's there's a whole there's a whole universe of, of software that uh, is business oriented that we want to make sure students understand. Also, how are applications delivered to your system? You download them, you install them off a off a disk, and where do they store information? So we've been looking at local storage, cloud storage, network storage, web browsers, and how they work. And I've got a I've got it called. Here, you need a license for that. It's a chapter that deals with application licensing, installation, and platforms. And by platforms, we're talking about just because you have Program X, if you have it for a Mac and a PC, will it work the same way? Maybe, maybe not. So we want, so we, we provide examples in, the t in that part of the text so that you can show students how to find out uh, if something will be exactly the same or very close or very different just because the name is the same. So looking at uh, apps and software, I want you to know that uh, the book has a lot of information for, for you if you're teaching with Macs or Linux as well as with Windows computers. And here's just one example of that here. There, here's the, the Mac terminal uh, uh, showing logs of, uh, of apps that are running. It's kind of a behind the scenes shot here. Uh, here we're taking a look at Operating Systems 101. And we're looking at Linux file permissions. You see this is a color-coded chart here. If you've never used Linux before, Linux can be confusing, but uh, we, we put illustrations in like this to try to help you understand it better. And then we have an example at the bottom of the Windows Task Manager, which is getting ready to shut down a task that's not needed. So the idea is that whether you're teaching Windows, Mac OS, Linux, or as, as more and more often happens, a combination we have the materials that you need to do that. Looking at software types and uses, we have uh, productivity software that we, that we discuss, 
collaboration software such as email, instant messaging, document sharing, business software such as database, project management, management, electronic medical records, accounting, and others. And in future chapters, uh, students will find out where they can get these. You'll find out where these where these are available for free, such as Open Office. And this will give you a chance to to set up experiments and and try many of these programs in your classroom. And we hope you will. We also look at how applications are delivered and where they store information. Uh, here's one of the dialogues from the text here. It's showing that uh, if you're using the Microsoft Word online version, that you can actually uh, save it to the OneDrive cloud storage, download a copy to your computer, save it as a, save it as a PDF, or save it as uh, an open document file for use with OpenOffice. And, we, and uh, of course, you have similar options if you're, if you're using Google Drive or Google Docs as well. Web browsers and how they work. There's a lot of, inform lot of information in, in that chapter about uh, dealing with web browsers, making sure that they're properly configured. Some of the features that, that would be, uh, that would be uh, interesting or useful at times, such as the incognito mode in Google Chrome, uh, how to clean up uh, problems with the information that browsers retain, what we call the browser cache. And it's not just about the so-called official browser for Windows. Uh, we, all, we, we cover also the, the, the third-party browsers, obviously, such as Google, uh, such as uh, Safari for Mac, such as Firefox, because we know in many cases that users are going to be running different kinds of browsers, and we want everyone to know how the major ones work. We have a chapter on application licensing, discuss it so that you can explain to your students what the difference is between commercial and open source. Can a commercial application be free? Yes, it can. Uh, an open source uh, application uh, is usually free, but sometimes uh, users will, will be asked to pay for support. Um, so so th these kinds of issues we clarify in that chapter. We also clarify uh, installation uh, options and platform considerations. Here, here we have, for example, uh, the compatibility checker for Microsoft Excel. And it's one of several examples in the chapter uh, looking at platform issues. And we can see that the, that the uh, Excel workbook that's being checked here, uh, if it's going to be saved back in a version for an old version of Excel, it isn't going to work because, because it's too large. Uh, it can, and it contains content that is not understandable uh, in the really old versions. So uh, you, you'll be able to discuss the, this issue with students so that they will understand that just because it's an Excel file doesn't mean it's always going to work. Uh, same thing with a doc file and so forth. That so students will understand if they are perhaps using an old version uh, at a, of Excel at home or an old version of uh, Word at home compared to what is available at the classroom or, or vice versa, that they need to be concerned about uh, making sure the file is going to work okay. We have, a, we have another section on software development. And in this section, we have programming languages and categories and examples. And by the way, uh, after, we look, after we finish up this overview, we're going to be providing you with links to a number of places from the text where you can go online and you and your students can try the different programming languages. We're also, we also discuss in a chapter how to plan and organize a program using approaches before you write the program, such as pseudocode, flowcharts, sequence, and then as well as, the, as well as the methods inside of a program, such as branching and looping and others that make a program better. And then finally, there are programming concepts discussed of various kinds, such as variables, constants, arrays, vectors, functions, objects, methods, and more. So the idea is that if you have students that are interested in software development, they will have the opportunity uh, by using this text and uh, the, the uh, resources available in it to actually try programming. And if you're not familiar with programming yourself, it's a chance for you to try it as well. It's fun. When you try it online, uh, there's no need to invest in software, uh, just an internet connection. So in the programming languages, and there are, you know, there are many of these, that we have BASIC, we have Java, 
uh, JavaScript, SQL, and so forth. We, we discuss the categories and we provide live, live examples. Here's a, an illustration of uh, using an online C compiler. So the, uh, we have the integrated development environment where you enter the text at the top and you, have you, you can put in inputs to command line arguments and then the result is shown in the black box at the bottom. So simple examples that, that people can try and right away see how these different languages, and there are several other ones besides the ones I've mentioned, how they're going to work. Here's an example of, of creating a flowchart, planning and organizing. And not only do we, do we uh, show flowcharts, but the, uh, we also provide links to various free flowchart apps uh, in the text. This particular one was done with one that I use a lot, which is Visio, but the same one could have been created just as easily using one of a number of flowcharts apps such as Gliffy, which is uh, discussed in the text. So the idea is that if you can flowchart your, uh, your program before you write it, you're much more likely to be able to, have, to write a good program because you understand the structure already. And then uh, programming concepts, and just a few of these were highlighted here, and we have an entire chapter that, that, that discusses and describes the differences uh, in these programming concepts. Now, moving on to our, our next category, that's database fundamentals. So what do databases do? How do databases store and organize data? How do, you, how do people find, change, and report on data stored in databases? And we're using, two different, we're using several different kinds of databases in these chapters. Um, one of the ones that we're using is the access database, and you see an example of a customer list query right here. But we also discuss using uh, databases that are based on JavaScript object notation, or JSON. And there are a, a, n a number of free resources for SQL or SQL databases, and we provide the links to those later in this presentation. And of course, they're also provided in the text. So uh, we, we provide a, a variety of opportunities for, for students to build, uh, if they'd like, uh, some, some databases and queries. And there are a lot of sample databases that are available online as well, and we provide links to some of those. So here's an example of using the codebeautify.org uh, website, which is a JavaScript object notation viewer. Now, on the left-hand side, we can see the, the JavaScript itself. And then on the right-hand side, we, we, can, we can see uh, what it looks like in a form. And you see, by comparing these side by side here, it makes it a lot easier to, to understand what the logic, what the logic is. And then we discuss interfacing with databases, and in this case, we're building a, a query. And uh, we also discuss how to build queries using uh, SQL statements as well. And uh, if you have if if you have uh, Microsoft Access available to you, what's interesting about it is it is primarily a GUI-based database, but it also does it, uh, SQL. So I began using it to learn SQL. This is an aside. Uh, the last uh, category is security in the uh, in the IT Fundamentals Plus test, and there there is a uh, a large number of different security aspects. It's one of the larger percentages of of questions will deal with security. So first of all, uh, we have a chapter on security threats. We have several illustrations. This is uh, this I, I captured this one a while back. Um, and this shows an example of a fake antivirus. And I've got I've got several examples of fake programs here. This one is this one pops up and tries to tell you that your system is is infected. And uh, this company, M Alert, whoever they are, has the answer to your question. And of course, the, 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 the their their answer is uh, we need your money and we won't clean up anything either. Device security best practices. We also we also uh, provide links to uh, online scanners. Uh, this one's from ESET. I chose this one. Uh, it's one of the one of the good ones out there, but uh, it it has an easy to use screen, and so we provide you with several links 
so that uh, if you have an opportunity to try these in class, you can. I was glad I tried this one. It, it didn't, uh, it looked, I, my, my system was a little more infected than I thought when I ran this. So uh, that's an ex along with using a, a, an online, I mean, a, a standard uh, installed antivirus using an online scanner as a backup is a very good idea. We provide several other uh, best practices in that chapter. Behavioral security. And what we're talking about here is we're talking about making sure that um, that documents are cleaned up properly before they're sent out. For example, there's a feature built into Word called a document inspector. And um, the, the, the underscore text at the top there is, is an example of hidden text. Uh, this is an angry letter. Uh, and someone someone uh, decided to really tick off uh, the head of Department X and then said, oh, I think I should hide this and rephrase it. Well, the problem is that uh, whoever receives that letter with the hidden text could easily unhide it, and uh, you could be in plenty of trouble for chewing out the head of Department X in your letter. And so by using a document inspector, and we also cover other kinds of hidden of hidden material that's called metadata, then we are encouraging encouraging users to clean this up and get rid of the hidden data before they send something out. There are a variety of ways to do it. That's one example in that chapter of, uh, of document, uh, of making sure that the documents and other kinds of behavior with computers is done safely. There are four keys to security. This is an example of one of them from the chapter uh, on, on uh, authentic authentication authorization, accounting, and non-repudiation. That's the idea of using one-time passwords, also referred to as OTPs. This is an example from the popular remote access program, Go to My PC. But uh, this is used by a lot of different programs, and the idea is that you can, that you can uh, create this list of uh, OTPs and then use these, uh, and, and it's a throwaway. You just uh, As you use each one-time password, you cross it off the list. And that way, even if somebody's uh, looking over your shoulder as you log on to your remote uh, site, uh, that password's gone now. You use it once, and it's shot. And that's just one of many examples in, in the chapter uh, on how to uh, keep data safely. Password best practices. And, and uh, we discuss, we discuss the, the idea of, uh, of password aging out. Of, uh, of avoiding the reuse of passwords and also of generating strong passwords. So we, we provide links to uh, software that can generate a strong password for you, rate your password for you, and also uh, show you show how to set up uh, things such as in Windows so that uh, passwords can be forced to be changed periodically. And I think you'll find resources that are that are good for you uh, as far as creating some hands-on exercises, you can, you can use these in your classroom and uh, show people the value of the strong passwords. Encryption best practices. Uh, we show how to, how to use various types of encryption, including the EFS feature that's built into some versions of Windows, and uh, also uh, third-party encryption, because we have the question of how to keep data safe, encrypted at rest, and also when it's being emailed and being received. So we provide the information, uh, the methods for, for encrypting data, because uh, these days it's not really safe if it's out in the open. And then our, our, last, our last chapter in the security section here deals with disaster recovery and fault tolerance. Uh, the idea is that that people that are working in a business are going to want to uh, take steps to make sure that uh, data faults can be recovered from by the use of data redundancy, such as backups, backup power, cloud storage. And then uh, if a disaster takes place and, and the business finds that its primary location is inaccessible or wiped out, having contingency plans that involve uh, some type of alternate sites that are, that are at various levels of readiness, uh, the idea of data restoration, and in deciding to do the most important tasks first, prioritization. So this would be another possibility here for a classroom exercise is, is creating a situation where maybe you'd say, well, what if we had to move our computer classroom somewhere else? What would we need? Just one example of how you can apply this in your classrooms. So um, 
we've just given you uh, an overview of uh, of the topics that are covered on the IT Fundamentals Plus exam. And now I want to now I want to get into some uh, uh, some some other ways that we can that we can do this. One of the benefits of this uh, exam and this text is that you can give your students an introduction to the wide variety of tech career paths. These are just a few of them. Programming, running a help desk, computer or device repair, uh, working with networks as a tech, as a, as a tech, as a manager, designing databases, information architect, security expert, and let's not forget that many times people people that are are not technical themselves need to manage technical personnel and resources. And so this is something that this is this is something that you can point out to your students to say, I'm not really a techie. Why do I need to know this? You need to know this because in many organizations, technical and non-technical people need to talk to each other. When they cannot talk to each other intelligently with mutual respect and understanding, bad things happen. So we think that this course we think this course, the certification, this text is going to be very helpful for people that are going to be directly involved with technology or those who will be kind of on the edges, kind of acting as a bridge between the technical and the non-technical people in a particular company. Okay, let's let's look at some of the links here. This is not a complete list of links, but it's a lot of the links that you'll find in the text here. Uh, Hands-on programming and online opportunities, uh, page one here. Google Drives and Google Docs. Google Drives online storage. Google Docs is, Docs is online documents. I know a lot of schools are already using these features, but if you're not, you can learn more about them. Uh, the basic language was, was the first computer language that was written for ordinary people. It's still very popular. Here, is, here are three places to learn more and to try it online. Quite Basic, Run Basic, and Small Basic from Microsoft. Uh, for people that are interested in Perl, um, you can try Perl online here. I don't have a link for JavaScript, but you'll find lots and lots of, re if you just type in JavaScript, you'll find lots of resources for that. Also, there's a link on page three for a website where you, where you have lots of different languages that you can try. Uh, a couple different sites here for Python, including Code the Blocks, which is really cool, as well as the official Python website. Uh, Ruby and try Ruby. And then on page three here, compileonline.com. Compileonline.com, if you just go there, you're gonna find just about any language that you can try and run online. So you could break up into groups of students or have each student say, okay, student A, you're gonna, I want you to try some JavaScript, student B, I want you to try some C++ and so forth. So you can have, you could have each of your students uh, you know, trying the different languages at the same time. And if you wanted to, a lot of them could use uh, just the uh, Compile Online site. For those of you that want to try SQL, this will require some downloading, uh, but there's a, a free SQL Server 2017 Express from Microsoft. There's a MySQL for Windows and Linux that's also free. And then uh, SAS uses SQL. You can learn more about that one. That's very popular in business. Okay, next thing I want to show you is a couple of examples from the Your Next Steps section. Almost uh, every chapter has a Your Next Steps section to it. It's also referred to as more certs. And the idea is that students who say, I really like what I'm learning in this chapter, where do I go for more? Or once I get the certification, what should I learn next? Well, let's, like, let's take a look at an example from chapter 10. If you love to build, configure or optimize computers for gaming, graphics, video, or 3D, consider getting a CompTIA a certification. However, if connecting computers and devices together is more your cup of tea, a CompTIA Network Plus certification might be your next step. And uh, we provide links in other chapters to, to the CompTIA website, comptia.org. So that's an example of kind of a general, you could go this way or this way. Sometimes the your next steps are a little more uh, specific. Here's one from one of the chapters on security. If you want to specialize in keeping private information private, check out the Certified Information Privacy Technologist, or CIPT, certification program 
from the International Association of Privacy Professionals. And we provide the uh, link to the IAPP website about this. So uh, as I say, uh, the, the first chapter is a, is a general overview of the entire exam. The last chapter is exam preparation. All the chapters between those um, have, have a next step section like this so that you can give your students intelligent advice about what to learn in the future. And uh, you can also do, you can also help them research based on the, the links and information that we provide right here. So we don't, we don't see this certification as an end of the process, neither does CompTIA for that matter. Uh, CompTIA recommends this one as the beginning of the IT process, and in keeping with that, we wanted to provide information not just about IT, not just about CompTIA exams that would be useful, but also about other uh, academic and certification uh, programs that would be useful uh, that cover the different topics. Now, um, what I want to talk about, and this is the this is the end of the uh, slideshow here, so I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop the sharing uh, right now. Is uh, uh, a little bit about preparing students for the certification. Um, this is a, it's a 75 question exam. It's multiple choice. Uh, depending on the exact questions on the exam, there may be some figures, but it's mostly multiple. It's mostly multiple choice. Uh, uh, testing, you know, A, B, C, or D, and you choose you choose one of the answers. My goal in writing this text was to go beyond just saying we're going to help you, you know, kind of skin through uh, this exam. Uh, many of my books have been recognized in the past as being resources that people will want to keep around, and that's my goal for this book too. I believe it's going to be an outstanding resource for people that want to get the certification. But it's also designed to be an outstanding resource for people that uh, want to have this want to have this text around as a reference. But let's look at getting the, the the certification. It's not necessary for people to memorize lots and lots of acronyms for this. Now they do provide they do provide a list of acronyms, and students should be familiar with those. But what's important with, with any of these certification exams today is understanding the why, not just the what or the how, but also the why. And so uh, we have, we have, we, we have uh, ex examples of, of we have questions in each chapter that, that people can answer uh, to, to uh, hone their skills. And we also want to develop that, that, that notion of, of, of understanding and wondering why, because the, the deeper that people get into this and the more that they, could, that they could think at a technology level, the better off they're gonna do uh, on the exam. One of the ways that you could that you could help your students really have good retention on this is to make sure that you're using uh, relevant examples. I, I've given you a few of them in this presentation, um, but as you learn who your students are, as you as you talk with them and find out what they're interested in, what they're hoping to do, maybe what they're afraid of about technology, um, th this is going to give you the opportunity to create examples for them, exercises for them, projects for them that are going to uh, help them with their own lives. You know, it's kind of a myth uh, that, that people that are say under 20 or 25 know everything about technology. Uh, my wife works as a children's and, and, and young people's librarian, and she is often amazed uh, at students who come in to do a research project and they, they barely can type anything. They don't understand how to use a browser, they don't understand how to search, um, they know how to play a game, they know how to use their phones, but they don't really understand technology, really. So don't assume, don't assume that you're going to be doing mostly review as you work with your students. We hope that you're going to be giving them the chance to discover a lot of things and to fill some gaps in their knowledge. So what else can you do to uh, help students prepare for the certification? Well, uh, Keeping in mind that students have different ways of learning, we've provided a combination of text, tables, and figures for people that like to read and also like to see things visually. And there's lots of opportunities in there for you to create hands-on uh, 
hands-on projects. We've also provided you with, with, exam with suggestions in the text, I'll just share a few of them right now, for what to do if you don't have a large budget to buy computer hardware. Ask for donations. Check with companies that are in the process of, uh, of retiring old computers. Check with your local electronic recycling, recycling centers and see if they have inoperable e equipment. Um, people don't really care uh, so much about, about putting something back together again if they weren't how to take it apart. So if you, if you ha can come up with some old desktop and laptop computers, even if they're four or five, six years old, they're going to be very similar in a lot of ways to the brand new stuff at the store right now. And encourage people to, to take things apart and see what makes them work. Uh, have them do partial disassembles, and, then, and, and if, they, if they are working machines that you can run the power, see the fans turn, see the lights come on inside, uh, it's great. The idea behind so many of the illustrations that we have in the text is to give you and your students the opportunity to see inside the hardware. What's going on inside the hardware? What makes the software work? And uh, if you can help people to understand this, they're going to do better on the exams. As they're taking a, a certification exam, a, a good philosophy uh, to follow is, is that everybody is that people should answer the questions they're sure about. Mark the questions they're not sure about. Go back later and then use a process of elimination. And uh, but, but they need to try to answer as many questions as possible. There's no credit for questions that are skipped. Um, but but to get that score to be as high as possible so they can pass on the first try, they should answer everything they know right away. Uh, we would encourage students to buy, when they're buying a, uh, a, a, a test certificate, if it's not included, try to, try to arrange for a free retake. Very often free retake versions of, of the uh, test voucher are available. We encourage that. Uh, I have had to take retake uh, it, uh, exams a couple of times in the past. And for people that maybe have test anxiety, being able to take it once and say, okay, if I blew it, it's no problem. I'm not out the money. I can take it again. So that will help to build confidence. And then uh, taking practice exams when they're available is going to be very helpful as well. So uh, just about time to wrap up this section here. Certification is self-discovery. This is a chance for your students to discover do they like technology? What parts of it do they like? Uh, and, it's, and it's your chance to, you know, to help fan the, to help fan the flame uh, and, and go from interest to information to knowledge. All right, I'm looking forward to answering your questions now. Uh, thanks so much for listening. And uh, let's see what we have in the way of questions. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, really great information. Again, everybody, uh, please submit any questions you have either through the Q&A feature uh, within Zoom or the chat window, and we're all happy to answer those now. There were some uh, questions earlier regarding providing uh, a recording of this webcast that will be sent out to everybody no later than Monday. We will also make the presentation slides available as well, so look for an email containing those. Also within the, the chat window there, I've included my email address, james.manley at pearson.com. If you'd like a review copy of Mark's book, um, feel free to email me and we'll get that out to you. Additionally, uh, Mark's mentioned that practice tests are a great way for students to prepare for uh, not only sort of uh, exam readiness, but career success. Um, the IT Fundamentals uh, Certification Guide includes two complete practice tests. Uh, we also have a premium edition ebook. Uh, that uh, includes two additional practice tests, so that's four total practice tests. All right, Mark, it doesn't look like we have any questions coming in. Give it a few more seconds here. Okay, well, um, I think that uh, I think that'll do it then. We have no additional questions coming in, so we thank you all for your time. Uh, again, look for the recording and the PowerPoint slides following this presentation. Thank you all for your time today. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon and have a great weekend. And thank you very much, Mark, uh, for all the great information today. Thanks, everyone. You're welcome. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.